fueled by Death Guest. I'm always curious uh, talking to musicians, especially musicians that have um, been in the business for a long time because you guys have a better perspective of it than most. Um, and I want to talk about like when, when you were a young kid, where was that moment where I want to be a musician, I want to pick up an instrument, and I want to, I want to you know, go out there and, and perform? When, did you have a moment like that? I had, it's funny, I had the same conversation yesterday with this writer guy that was interviewing me. He, So I, it's clear in my head, it's that I wanted to be a graphic artist. Like, I started doing that when I was four. Like, not graphic art, but, you know, uh-huh. like drawing and taking classes and painting. And, like, that was my thing. I went to Otis Parsons for a summer like until I was about 14, I, that's all I wanted to do. I had no interest in playing music. I loved music, but I didn't want to do it, you right. know. And my mom had a nylon string acoustic guitar that my dad bought her. And I started messing around on that. I tried to learn how to play Stairway to Heaven. Of course. It was too hard. Yeah. <laughs> too hard. So I, I basically, and then I took some lessons in school in junior high. And they were like, oh, you can't play with a pick. You know, you got to just play with your fingers. And I was like, I didn't want to. So I, you know, so between that and not being able to learn how to play Stairway to Heaven, I just gave up. And then a year later, like I grew up in Hollywood, right? So uh, there was, so when I was starting 10th grade, it was like I'd cut my hair, like punk rock over the summer. And, you know, it's like now I'm in the Black Flag and Circle Jerks and all those bands. Oh, yeah. And, and there was this band, this kid punk band called Mad Society. And they all went to Fairfax where I went. And so we, I started hanging out with those guys. And this girl showed me how to play bar chords. And at that moment, dude, as soon as the bar chord thing happened for me, and I was like, what? I can play any song <laughs> with bar, with just these two shapes? And really, at that point, it was just like... It, I never stopped, you know, it was like, I'm just going to play all the time. And I just, I loved it, you know? So that was kind of the, the thing. And as I was learning to play, I was like singing very badly in punk mm-hmm. bands, but that's kind of how I started, you know, at least learning how to write songs or shape songs or whatever until I got good enough where I could actually play guitar in a band. That's awesome. You you talked about how you picked up um, you, the the nylon string guitar there. What was your first electric? It was a fake Strat. <laughs> I have a I have a picture of it somewhere, like me sitting on my edge of my bed with it. It was like a, a sunburst Strat with a KLOS sticker on it, and and it was it was great. You know, I bought it for you know, like you do when you're a teenager yeah some friend of yours has a 60 dollar guitar because he doesn't play it anymore or whatever yeah Yeah, there's a lot of that so you you pick up guitar you start playing bar chords you start playing in punk bands when did you start to see uh your music career as a career as like oh this is something that's actually sustainable well like I got really into playing guitar and I was a terrible student at that point because I was just, you know, I was drinking a lot and whatever in 10th, 11th grade. And basically I didn't, you know, I was like, look, mom, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to college. You know, I love playing guitar. I played all the time. I want to go to music school. You know, I want to go to MI instead of going to 12th grade. And she's like, you're a terrible student. So you might, you might as well. <laughs> do something you know like if you pass the ged which is like the high school equivalency thing you can go to music school so that's what happened you know i passed the test i went to music school for a year and just played like and practiced 12 hours a day so that's why i really got into it and then i think the first time was really when i was in when i joined wasted youth with joey castillo that's where i met him and you know it was the first band that we played gigs and actually 
made a little bit of money and made a record and you know where it was like oh wow this is this could happen yeah um and we've had uh uh, joey Castillo on the show too and we talked a little bit about uh those early days with wasted youth and i want to hear kind of your perspective of that too like what was it like being a part of that punk that punk scene in the late 80s like in california like what was that like for you i mean you know it's funny because i listened to those but you know because i was in a band when i was in danzig it was me blasco and joey so you cool. know that was the lineup so it was killer and i love those guys so much so i listened to those podcasts you know the uh, the death wish ones um last week after i knew i was doing it and all the stuff joey said is totally false <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> totally lied yes no, it was you know it was killer dude it's like i like i said i grew up in hollywood i went to fairfax and and uh you know, all that stuff, like the Decline movie had just, I remember the premiere of the Decline movie on Hollywood Boulevard and going to see it. They premiered it at midnight and they wouldn't. And there was so many people there. Like, that's the closest I felt to like really feeling like there's something really bad could happen, like a fucking riot or something. Mm-hmm. Like there was, it was so packed outside waiting in line that you couldn't move your feet. So if the crowd started to like kind of tilt one way, you couldn't put your hands down or even move your feet to steady yourself. You were literally just in this fucking sea of people, sea of punk rockers. And, you know, they were only showing it once at midnight. And there was so many fucking people there that they had to show it twice because there was kids like sitting in the aisles, you know, and it was awesome. Like, you know, like that kid Eugene, I'd see around, you know hanging around Fairfax and my junior high. And it was just, it was fucking awesome. I'll just say that, you know, I was a 16 year old kid going to the Starwood, seeing black flag and the circle jerks and agent orange and all these killer bands. And it was just, you know, it was amazing. And being a part of, you know, just being able to see all of it firsthand and, and you know, going into a into a slam pit for the for your first time at a Circle Jerks concert, like you know, like oh, it's, they're playing Red Tape. I'm going in, <laughs> you know, and you just fucking go in. I got socked in the eye, and I'm walking around the Starwood with a cup of ice on my eye, but still there, you know. And it was it was a whole, you know, it was a movement. And it's funny because now as a parent, I think about like I remember. I had these engineer boots and I cut up uh, or someone gave, I think I bought them off some other dude and there was like cut up uh, American flags hanging off the back, you know, as like decoration. And I didn't get any of it at that point. And my mom would be like, you're going to get beat up, you know, because I had to take the bus everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, it's cool. You know, I just fucking didn't get it. And I just, it's just trippy to like think about my mom's perspective, you know, and just sending her kid out, you know, into the world every day with spiky hair and, you know, getting sweaters from my grandfather to wear just like, you know, all the shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, you know, the it's just like, God, if you, now I feel bad. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like, like all the torture I put her through. Not just with my drinking and my, you know, drugs and stuff, but just with the, the whole punk rock thing at the most of any musical part of my, what you know, career. So, but it was, it was amazing. So speaking on the drinking and the drugs a little bit, um, which you, you've had your fair share of run-ins with that. At what, at what point uh, in your life did you decide to step away from that and really really clean things up uh you know it was after wasted youth um i got in this band called the electric love hogs which was like an la band it was kind of like a faith no more type band Mm -hmm. the drummer went on to go to play in this band orgy and the singer is was in that band goldfinger and he's Mm -hmm. like a big producer now but we're still like I still hang out with 
the drummer Bobby and and Feldy the singer and we're still friends and you know but during that band I was really like bottoming out and I worked at Tower Video and on Sunset and you were I just sat in the basement you were working at Tower Video while you were in the band yeah Oof. yeah I mean you know dude like back then it was like I mean we got a record deal but you know then with the with the love hogs and but it's just like i think we just were all had enough sense to keep our jobs until i don't know why you know but we were like well if we split up all this money and then what if you know the bass player spends all his money then what are we gonna do then we're gonna be fucked and but so we had like a stipend and we would all still work and you know, worked our job, but my job was killer, dude. I sat in the basement and fucking made signs for the store, like, and drank all day long. Excellent. And that was, it was killer. (laughs) But so, but, you know, having said that, it was like really, I really, you know, bottomed out and just, you know, I don't know, you know, how, I mean, for me, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a very common thing. I think when you, bottom out on drugs and alcohol it's like i never woke up in the morning and said you know i'm gonna cheat on my girlfriend today and i'm gonna you know crash my car and i'm gonna you know do all this heinous stuff that isn't okay with my moral compass and then you know but i would do it because i'd be drunk all day long every day in a blackout half the time and doing shit that i regretted all the time and then it's like you wake up the next day and you hate yourself and then you do it all over again and then you you know it's just like this downward thing and for me i was just from the minute i woke up to the minute i passed out at night you know you should interview joey after and he could have told you about the times he had to like carry me (laughs) like he had my hands and this other friend of ours had my feet and he would throw me in the back of a pickup truck and i just be laid in the back of a pickup truck and they'd be, you know, after having just tackled some friend of ours in the parking lot, cause I was happy to see him. And like, that was, that was where I was at. And, you know, I just stopped. I just hit a friend of mine was, you know, not drinking. And I just called that dude and was like, dude, I can't, I can't do this anymore. You know? And he, he really helped me out. And so, and you know, and that was it. Yeah, it's so important to reach out in moments like that. And I, almost always when people find success with with going clean like that, it's it's there's almost always somebody by their side to kind of help them through that. And it's, it, it's just so important to reach out, I guess, when when you get into a spot like that. And and I think we saw a little bit of that um, in Velvet Revolver with with Scott. And he kind of seemed like. Duff really, really reached out and and was that guy for him, and it and it really seemed to work out eventually with Velvet Revolver. Can you talk a little bit about like I don't know? It seemed like there there was a lot of drama tied up with first off with this band, but it <laughs> looks like it kind of like became like this really awesome thing. What was it like to be a uh, part of that roller coaster? It, well, you know, I mean, fuck, it changed my life. Yeah, you know what I mean, like. Like I was, I mean, up until that point, you know, I'd played in Wasted Youth with Joey. That's how I got in Danzig. When I was in Danzig, you know, it was in the Love Hogs. But for me at that, at that point, it was always, you know, I was in a band, we got a record deal. We didn't, you know, we could kind of sustain, we'd go on a tour, we'd tour for, you know, nine months and then it would be done. Like whatever, the record would get dropped or, you know, this or that. And then I'd have to just work. You know, and I used to like build sets and stuff and basically but on set and and then I another thing and then you know so until that point, you know, like I was playing with Duff. They started the band kind of with the two guys from Buck Cherry. That wasn't working out. Duff called me, he's like, dude, you should learn these songs. They had like eight songs mm-hmm. originals and they're should learn these dude because i think we're gonna you know split from the guitar player like next week i was like all right all right cool and mind you you know for me it was like 
it was easier, I think, than a lot of guys because I've known Slash since I was 13 years old. Like, we went to junior high school. We went to high school together. We knew each other. We we had out, you know, we'd gone to parties together. We had, you know, done stuff together. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Duff, I was playing in one of his bands at the time. Scott, I'd known since 1989 because wow. our bands would play. Like that band I was in, Electric Love Hogs, was playing little clubs with Mighty Joe Young, which became Stone Temple Pilots. Yeah. So I I saw Scott the day he got signed to Atlantic, and I remember him telling me like, "Dude, I just got a record deal, and it's on Atlantic Records, and it's like not a lot of money, but it's gonna be fucking awesome." And but he like so like a kid, yeah. you know. And so I'd known Scott forever, and we, you know we'd been friends. So when I came into it, it was like, so Duff calls me the next the next day after he'd give me the song. He's like, "Dude." I just fired the guitar player. You got to come down tomorrow. I was like, what? Whoa. You know, like, fuck, dude. And this was, mind you, you know, we didn't, there was no singer at this point. And so I came down and, you know, I just, fuck, I don't know. I just did my thing and, and I never left. They never tried anyone else out. And then, you know, at that point, we, we just started working. Like we would literally rehearse five days a week writing songs and looking for singers and we did that for 10 months before we found scott wow so it was just the four of us and you know it was but it was hard because it's like i didn't have a job we didn't weren't making any money we didn't have a record deal duff and slash were footing the bill for the rehearsal but you know i would get a, a job offer and i'd be like oh i wouldn't want to take it right you know, because i because i didn't want to lose my spot you know, so I started working at the rehearsal studio where we were rehearsing just so I could keep my spot, wow. you know. And then Izzy came in. Dude, like six months in, Izzy, they're like, oh, Izzy wants to come down and jam. Like, oh, fucking great. Great. <laughs> you know, and and Dan Duff was like, dude, it's going to be fine. You know, he's like, he'll come into town. He'll want to work on some shit for a week or two and then he'll bail because he can't just stay in one place and. That's exactly what happened, but I was kind of freaking out. And then, you know, I'd seen Scott at the gym, and I gave him a CD with some songs. And he was like, okay, cool, I'll check it out. And he wasn't, he was still in SCP. Then a couple months later, he, you know, he came down, and and we gave him the CD, and he picked a song, and he, put vocals on it like in a day and we were like this is it like it was fucking it was set me free you know on the first record it was just undeniable it was like that that demo sounded exactly like the like the track on the record you know and it was like but obviously we were super because i think at that point no one was drinking in the band no one was everyone was like clean at that point Mm -hmm. and we were super pensive you know and it's funny. There's this documentary on VH1 called "The Rise of Velvet Revolver." I, I actually I actually watched that today. It was really really good. Dude, it's so stressful like watching that. <laughs> I like bet when Slash is sitting there on the phone and he's like playing with that little plastic uh, candy wrapper and he's like, "Oh, okay, so he's got the flu." Oh, uh, you know, and uh, which is like every junkie story when they're sick. Yeah. Because right. you know when you're when you're at that point, that's you get flu like symptoms. So it's like, you just say you have the flu, and he was like missing, and fucking, we were like, really, are we gonna do this? And it was fucking stressful, and you know, and then it just, we did it, and he was fucked up, and he got arrested like two weeks into it. He went to jail because he got pulled over with drugs on him. Yeah. And but then again, and the next three songs he wrote were Slither set me free no slither uh the fucking i don't know the ballad song i can't mm-hmm. remember the uh, <laughs> fall to pieces all right pieces. Yeah, and then yeah. big machine those are the next three demos wow you know so we were like well fuck all right this is it <laughs> like we're doing this and you know scott knew me and knew that i wasn't drinking and stuff and so we talked about that and he stayed at my apartment because he wasn't I don't know where he was living, but 
it's like i'm like really dude all these guys got houses you want to stay in my fucking apartment (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah. and you know and so we started there and we just started and then duff and i you know tried to help him as much we could and then we were off and running and it was like a fucking episode of behind the music for the first for the whole time (laughs) pretty much (laughs) you know it was like like i remember times where he you know, he was rehab and he was leaving. Mm-hmm. And I was going to a tasting at a caterer's for my wedding. And my manager called and she's like, you have to go get Scott. He's leaving rehab. Uh. I'm like, what? You know, and I'm uh. like, oh, fuck me. And so I'm like, you know, I'm telling my wife and my wife, you know, my fiance. And she's like, well you know you gotta go like what are you gonna do it's your band like okay let's go so she drops me off and i'm like sitting there trying to talk to him and you know there was a lot of that kind of stuff there was a lot of craziness and people falling off the wagon and you know but then again it was like i mean that was the the stressful part you know like a lot of scott now showing up to shows you know, playing at Stubbs and where is it? It's somewhere in Texas. I forget. But, you know, we were like 20 minutes late and we had no clue where he was. Wow. And he had gone to like score something, you know, mm-hmm. and the tour manager called him and he actually answered his phone and he's like, oh, hey, Pete. <laughs> like, <laughs> dude, where the fuck are you? He's like, oh, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, and he's just like, dude, look around you. What buildings do you see? <laughs> he's like <laughs> asking, putting on speaker, asking like the security guard that's, you know, local, like, where is he, dude? And he's like, oh, I think he's on like 34th and, and, you know, whatever street. And so he's like, all right, stay there and we're going to come get you, you know, and his fucking tooth had fallen out and he's <laughs> singing oh, with no. it was fucking crazy and you know so there was a lot of that but there was a lot of you know amazing stuff too like we won a grammy and we did this thing on the grammys where we played with you know we did we were the band and it was a song with like like brian wilson and yeah. stevie wonder and bono and Steven Tyler. Yeah, and that was nuts. Really, yeah, it was like, you know, stuff like that where, and and the coolest thing was my wife had just gotten into photography, and so she had a camera everywhere, and she came with us, like, everywhere, because she got along with everyone, and, and, you know, so she was on tour for 60, 70% of the time, and, like, I have the raddest pictures of, like, me with, Paul McCartney or just all those people I listened to growing up, like, you know, Roger Daltrey or Jimmy Page and Rob Plant and, you know, fucking Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder and just all these heroes of mine, you know? And I mean, that's, that's to me, that's probably one of the best things besides, you know, the, the cash and prizes. Of course. (laughs) So, I'm curious how much of that stress and pressure contributed to the success and awesomeness of Velvet Revolver. Um, yeah, it's weird, man. It's like, you know, you, you, there's always that, that, uh, that word dangerous, you know, and you hear it and it's like, I would hear it and I would just roll my eyes because I was in the band, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, Oh, it's a dude, dude. We gotta, you know, you'd hear some guy in the band like, oh, it's dangerous. This band's dangerous. And you're just like, what? Come on, dude. <laughs> like, it'd be dramatic. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I guess it was, you know, in a sense. And, and I'm not sure if, I don't know, you know, I don't know if, if, you know, honestly speaking, if that element of the, the, wheels you know the fear of the wheels inevitably falling off yeah um and your fucking car it's like riding in a maserati that's like duct taped together like (laughs) 
is it going to fucking fall apart? <laughs> you know, you know, and you know, I, I'm not, I honestly, I don't know how much of that actually added to the awesomeness. You know, I mean, obviously I guess it, 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 in a big picture, like it draws people in, you know, I don't know if it, if the music was better because of that, hmm. you know, I don't know if the songs were better. I'm sure that, you know, Scott was really introspective. So obviously, you know, that turmoil, cause he just wouldn't let anyone else write lyrics. Like even when we tried and we're like, how about this thing? He's like, dude, I, you know, I got it. And a lot of that introspection was obviously because of his journey. So, so I guess, you know, I guess it did contribute, you know, speaking on like Scott, you know, not allowing other people to write lyrics and stuff like in a band like Velvet Revolver, you're all huge personalities, both on stage and off stage. Um, what was that writing process even like? Um, you know, it's not, I'm sure, like a conventional band in a, in a room writing a song together. Well, it's interesting because like the first record, it was like that, you know, it was very like, like I said, it was easier for me. I wasn't as nervous. I, I had known those guys forever, even though I wasn't a name, you know, it was, it was just the four of us writing songs with no vocals for 10 months. So like when Scott came in the band, we had 60 plus songs written. Wow. Damn. Yeah. And like we had a huge dry erase board and we come up with these stupid names for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like <laughs> it, it was hilarious, you know, <laughs> like, and, and, you know, he, we gave him a CD with two CDs, you know, with, with all 60 songs. And then he picked out like, you know, Slither and Big Machine. And, but mind you, no, with no vocals. Right. And then he wrote those. And then we wrote like maybe six songs with him. And to be honest, it was just like, it was the same. You know, because I'd known Scott for so long, mm -hmm. because even though the personalities were big, it was still like when you meet in that, in that, because it was like Scott was in, you know, he was excited. He was like, I'm doing this. He didn't come in like, you know, some jaded dick, you know, he came in like, I, I see this as an opportunity to fucking get my shit together. These guys, you know, have their shit together. I think they can help me. I remember seeing Dave when he was fucking out of his mind and now he's, you know, semi responsible and whatever. And he saw it as an opportunity to like get clean. He saw it as an opportunity to move on from, you know, SDP. He, you know, so he was in and everyone there was like, all right, cool. Let's fucking do this. We were relieved that we weren't just still looking for a singer and that we had found a fucking awesome one. And, so, you know, it was the same. We just all five guys in a room just writing shit and coming up with shit and saying like, oh, what if we do this here? And it was super like it's supposed to be, Yeah, you know, like five dudes all contributing. Scott, you know, not writing lyrics on the spot, but just coming up with melodies like on the spot, just singing weird shit or saying like, what if we kept going right there? What if like then we went like this? And, you know, it was it was fucking an it was awesome, you know, at that point. And then we did the same thing for the second record, but when, but then it's like, that's when it got, it started getting a little weird, yeah. you know, like we started off the same way, like the four of us just writing songs. We had like 40 songs and then he came in and then it was like, you know, on off the wagon. And then it was like, then it was getting a little drunk. And it got weird too. Like we were supposed to use Rick Rubin and we had started with Rick, that second record. And then, you know, like we, we split from Rick abruptly. And Scott was like, I'm calling Brendan O'Brien. And then Brendan was like, I'll, I'll come out next Thursday and let's start. And we were like, Oh, okay. You know? And, and so it was just like a weird, thing and then brendan was in the room and then we were writing songs and brendan's like the best musician in the room you know and he's like sitting there watching and listening and going what if we do this and what if you sing this and what if we 
so it was it was you know it was really different than which usually that's the way it goes yeah. you know you spend forever writing your first record and then you get you go on tour and you're doing then the machine's going and then you got to make a second record yeah. and you don't have all that time and uh, all those songs and all the you know like oh let's just try this let's try that it's like all right good we gotta fucking we gotta do you know we gotta go we gotta so it's different yeah uh, so he talked about a, a taped up maserati when when did the when did the tape kind of start to let <laughs> loose mm. I always have this fear, like I'm being too candid, <laughs> but, but fuck it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, really on the second tour is really when it, we had heard some rumblings that Scott wanted to do SDP. He had quit SDP or gotten kicked out one or the other right before Velvet Revolver. Mm -hmm. Then we were going along and then he started to uh and then we went you know from like 2002 late 2002 till 2006 so it was just on till then but then we started hearing some rumblings of those guys like i don't I, you know i honestly i don't know exactly how it happened but we started hearing rumblings of him wanting to do another scp record or tour and stay in velvet revolver that was the thing he wanted he wanted to do both bands and we were like, no, yeah, because it was too much. Like, and also because, to be honest, like, that's when things started getting segregated within the the five. You know, like, he would, you know, especially after the second record, he was traveling very separate. You know, I think part of it was he was just doing his own thing, and and he. Yeah. I don't know. You know, maybe he was afraid that we were going to be like, dude, what's up? Or whatever it was, or he just needed to be separate so he could do his thing, you know, when he was drinking or doing whatever. And and he he just got super segregated and he started getting super introverted. And he would, you know, and it was like a microcosm of how I heard GNR was in the end. Yeah. And so those guys had like PTSD basically yeah. from, you know, going through stuff that they went through with GNR and like waiting and him showing up late. And then, you know, I'm speaking of Scott, like he would show up late and then he would just not say anything to us and just like have to get ready and, you know, have sunglasses on. Cause that's where we were on stage. But you just felt like really dude, like that. We don't get nothing like no apology. No, Hey guys, I'm sorry. I'm late. I just fucking lost track of time. Or it was just like blank. Jeez. Like, here I am. Fuck you guys. Like, that's how it felt. You know, like, all right, let's fucking play. You guys ready? Because I'm fucking ready. You know, and it just, it really felt not cool. And so we were getting more and more resentful and, and uh, he was getting more and more segregated and, and it just fucking, you know, it just built up and built up. And we were just like, dude, you can't, you know. It's, it's, you know, there's a lot to it. There's, yeah. a, there's like, money issues. And then it's, like, you know, someone's renting a limo and in fucking... It's, like, stupid shit. Like, I'm gonna, we're going to go to New York. I'm going to rent a limo and drive around in New York, and then I'm going to charge the band for it. Mm. And the band was very, like, you know, aware. You know, so we were like, no, dude, you can't fucking charge us. That's your money, you know. Like I'm not paying for that, right? And that kind of shit too. So, you know, he, he could stay in different hotels than us, even. And it just got really hard, and it got really frustrating. And and we just the four of us were all on one bus, and he was on another bus, and we just started, you know, kind of talking and just being like, "Dude, we can't do this. This is too fucking, you know, it's too hard." Yeah. And so we, I mean, to be honest with you, we fired him, you know, and, and that was it. You know, we fired him. We had thought we could replace him and obviously we couldn't, you know, and like we could never find anyone that was on that level, you know, or someone that was equally 
as awesome in a different way that we were like, this is the new guy. Right. You know, and we looked when we tried for like a year and a half. And, wow. You had tryouts and everything? Oh, dude, we tried. We worked with like fucking, we recorded like eight songs with Corey Taylor. We Whoa. had this guy, Frankie Perez, who is still a good friend of mine who's a fucking amazing singer. But like the first, we actually told him he was in the band. He was the only guy that actually got hired. But then we kept recording stuff with them and it just kind of, the longer we worked with them, the less it felt right. Mm -hmm. And there was other factors. Like I think Slash was kind of getting ready to do a solo record. And I think his head was already kind of over there at that point. And, but we worked with like the singer from Big Wreck. We worked with the singer from Space Hog. We worked with, we, you know, it's like we even talked. I mean, we didn't work with Lenny Kravitz, but there was like some talk about us doing stuff with him. And Whoa. Wow. There was, yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of talk, you know, and there was a lot of dudes trying to get that job too, you know, like the first time. But obviously at that point it was, you know, people knew yeah. and, uh, you know, so, but it just didn't, didn't happen. Yeah. So where did things progress from there? But, you know, Velvet Revolver kind of fizzles out and it it kind of seems like you get more into um, more into the writing side of things with, um, you know, we we see that you uh, co-wrote um, the Sons of Anarchy theme. Like how, how did how did that line a uh, timeline progress? Well, so Frankie Perez got hired by the band he moves from las vegas to la he has no money uh -huh. and then all of a sudden he's not in the band and i felt horrible for him because i've always you know was kind of like the underdog in the band and i'm like oh dude that's so that's so fucked up and yeah. and but by coincidence he moved like six blocks away from my house and i just have my first kid um and I really loved Frankie and we just started writing songs and he would come over to my house every day and we would write songs and we would hang out and, you know, it just got really more focused on writing. And then by, it was super serendipitous, man. Like my friend, Bob Thiel, who was the music supervisor and composer on Sons of Anarchy, it was me, him, the bass player from Weezer, uh, and this other guitar player, friend of ours that plays with Paul McCartney. And we were all been friends before we all got like our gigs. Mm -hmm. And we were all at Johnny Rockets hanging out. And Bob was like, dude, I think I'm going to do this show. And it's kind of like The Sopranos meets The Hell Angels. And they hadn't started filming anything yet. And he was friends with Kurt. Sutter and Katie and he was like you know uh you know I'm gonna I gotta come up with like bands and stuff and I was like dude you should get bands like you should get some fucking songs like from Monster Magnet and Clutch and bands like that yeah you know that are fucking like just that vibe to me you know and and he was like oh, okay and he said you know if you have any stuff you know, if you want to write some stuff, because he had a little studio at his house. And my my default is no, because I'm <laughs> fucking scared. You know, <laughs> you know, like like that's how I'm wired. So I say yes. You know, to to counteract that. And I was like, oh okay. And <laughs> I was friends with I'm I've been friends with Shooter Jennings for a long time, and I had written that main riff for Shooter. And wanted to do it, do something with Shooter, because he and I had been hanging out at that point. So that's why it's kind of country-ish, yeah, kind of, yeah. you know, rock thing. And I just went to Bob's and we fucking wrote the song that day. And wow. we wrote the vocals, we wrote the whole thing. Because, you know, I mean, you're, granted, you're only writing a 30-second song. Right. You're not writing a fucking, you know, two and a half, three and a half minute song. And I tried to get Shooter to sing on it, and 
it just didn't work out at that point. And then, uh, so that happened, you know, it, it got on the show. We got nominated for a grant, uh, an Emmy yeah. for that song. And, you know, then it was like, Oh shit, I need to do more of this. And, I kept doing stuff here and there for the show with, with Bob. And then I was like, you know, maybe this is where I need to be. And then the next thing was Bob was a music supervisor on this show for ABC, this cop show. And he's this, like my best friend, this guy, John O'Brien, he was like, do you guys think you could compose for this show? And we were like, fuck yeah. And we sent some stuff in and, and they loved it and then we did 18 episodes of that show which like we did all the underscore and and i dude i didn't know fucking what's a cue i didn't know what the fuck i was doing and my buddy john was like you know just basically showed me how to do it or or writing music to picture or lining up the session with time code and all that shit like i had no fucking clue and it was just you know i just did it and that's where I learned how to do it. And just, I've just been really fucking fortunate. You know, it's like, I've just met and known a lot of great people growing up here. And, and I've just been able to, you know, make it work, man. My friend, Peter Billingsley is runs, uh, Ralphie from, or not, wait, was he Ralphie? The little kid from a Christmas story. Yeah. That's Ralphie. Yeah, the glasses. Peter, yeah. Peter Billingsley. Yeah, yeah. He's my, he's my boss. Oh my like, god! Because so he runs, he runs Vince Vaughn's uh, production company. Okay. And so, like, I ended up doing a show for them on TBS that was kind of like Cheers, and then, and now, doing Efforts for Family on Netflix. Oh, cool. With Bill Burr. Yeah, that's a great uh, show. It's fucking thanks. I mean, it's it's awesome. You know, it's like yeah. again a dream job. Like, make a bunch of stuff that sounds like the seventies, or <laughs> you know. We need a song that sounds like the Almond Brothers. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yes, we do. You know, so it's like, and I got to be friends with Bill, and now Bill and I hang out. And oh, we that's played so together. Cool. It's 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 great, man. It's you know, it's it's. I don't know. I I'm just when I talk about it, I get really stoked because it's like when I when I look at my life and my career since Velvet Revolver, and I've been so fucking lucky to, you know, be able to make a living playing music and sometimes in a very different way than what I was doing before. That's, well, it, it's such a cool journey that you've been on. You just like, uh, you know, the roller coaster that was Velvet Revolver and then the fortune of really finding your niche within the, within the, uh, you know, the composing world for TV shows and, you know, the Sons of Anarchy theme. It's, it's, you know, it's such a school, cool story, you know, and uh, I, I'm curious, looking back, what was the, like the funnest moment of your career where you're like this this is the coolest time of my life right now oh boy um i don't know dude there there i honestly i don't know if there's one i remember some things that stand out like like i remember my buddy, so like I said, those three guys, right? Like me, Scott Schreiner from Weezer, and Brian Ray from Paul McCartney. Like before, we used to all three hang out when none of us would have those gigs. Mm-hmm. And we all got our gigs like within the same year. Crazy. And, you know, we kind of like, because those are big gigs, man. And it's like you're you're coming into things that are already somewhat established. And you're not with VR so much, but like the, the heaviness of the dudes that you're playing with and we kind of would help each other out, you know, like talk each other off the ledge, you know, if like fucking Paul didn't talk to Brian that day and like, Oh dude, I think I'm going to get fired or <laughs> flash was looking at me weird. I think I'm, I think I'm out, you know, or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> They're like, dude, stop auditioning. You already played on the record. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. And, and, uh, but I remember Scott telling me, like I'd got my first check. It was like for 12 grand or something. And he was like, dude, I'm just going to tell you this now. Enjoy it. Cause it's never going to feel the same again. You know? And it was like, it was fucking true, man. I remember calling my mom and calling the automated like bank teller thing. 
that says your checking account balance is twelve thousand dollars <laughs> and forty nine cents or whatever yeah. and i kept calling it dude like what really are you kidding me and, and i called my mom on three-way i'm like listen and funny thing was i called it so much that it doubled like it was like and i, I didn't get like oh you know how the whole thing worked back then like the accountants and this and maybe they put more money in and oh i don't know what happened <laughs> and i called the person at the bank and they're like oh no that's a mistake you just have 12 I was like, ah, oh, fuck. Still awesome, but eh. <laughs> I know. It was like, but like that or, you know, like I'd always wanted a Cadillac STS. Like, Ooh, I'm like, nice. if I ever get money, that's the car I'm going to buy, you know? And like, I remember like the day I got my car and I was just like, wow. like that was huge for me, you know, or buying when I bought, a, like when the Chargers first, the new Chargers first yeah, came out in like 2006. Yeah. And I remember going to like the Dodge dealership and there was a, an SRT8 charger literally in the showroom and I fucking bought it. <laughs> and it was like, you know, like I was really good with my money, but like there was a couple times where I was like, I want that fucking car. And right. that was like our biggest year. And I'm like, and they just like driving that car off the showroom floor. I didn't drive it off the showroom floor. The guy had to drive it out for insurance reasons, <laughs> but you know, like driving that, like my my wife had i forget she left separately and so it was just me in the car you know what i mean like driving through la where i grew up and just like in that fucking car it was like it was magic you know yeah. what i mean like that kind of shit stands out to me or being in the room with you know back when we did uh when we did that grammy thing um we hadn't rehearsed with those guys. Oh, wow. Ever. Wow. We had just played across the universe with the four of us. And so the day of the Grammys, we were all in a room and it was just Slash playing acoustic. Like me and Duff weren't even, we were just standing there and we were in a room with all those people. And they all had like, you know, age where like, okay, this is my part in the verse that I'm this. And you know, standing like, like literally a foot. Like I was right behind Stevie Wonder. <laughs> and like that guy's my fucking hero. You know, like before I ever started listening to music, when I first started listening to music was like the first step I was turned on to was Ohio Players, um, you know, Earth, Wind & Fire, Stevie Wonder. Because my best friend had older brothers that just listened to all that shit. Yeah. And that was my shit, you know, it still is like the meters and all those fucking bands. It's like, and just to be standing behind that, that was a huge moment. And one more that I really, it's, that was amazing. Like that was, we played live eight, uh -huh. you know, that, that Bob Geldof, the second time like yep. thing in London. And my wife was there and we were, the the thing about it was the backstage were trailers but they were all in a big circle so there was this huge like half a like quarter of a football field area mm -hmm. where it was just a common area where every fucking celebrity you've ever thought of was there wow and that like i i remember viscerally like walking in and me and my wife it was like 3 30 in the afternoon and we were so fucking overwhelmed, like just our brains couldn't take it. Like you look to your left and you're like, oh, there's Brad Pitt. And, whoa, he's talking to Gwyneth Paltrow and they're divorced. And because she's with the guy from Coldplay and there's Madonna <laughs> and there's fucking Harvey Weinstein and there's Sting and there's Bill Gates and there's Snoop Dogg. And there's, you know, it was like, wow, there's there's a fucking dudes from Pink Floyd and yeah. there's Elton John and there's Paul McCartney and. Dude, it was like, it was like no experience I've ever had wow. being in that backstage area, in an open area in the daylight, just seeing all these people talking to each other and being in the fucking middle of it. You know, it was like, it was fucking crazy. It sounds you know? like a dream sequence almost. Like you're just there it with was. everybody. It's so weird. And then the funniest part is it all ends because my wife like is trying to take pictures uh -huh. backstage like 
And mind you, it's daytime and it's outdoors. And she just kept, but she had this big camera, so she kept taking pictures. And then at one point, the security guards were like trying to kick her out. Because, <laughs> you know, and we, it's like me and two managers, like, no, 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 she's, that's my wife. And blah, blah, blah. Promise we won't take any more pictures. <laughs> funny. That's funny. So, yeah. so through it all, through from, you know, the early beginnings with, with the punk scene to into Velvet Revolver and beyond and everything that you've gotten to do with your career. Uh, what fuels you to keep doing it, to keep, you know, tr- striking out on a new path maybe or even just, you know, picking up that instrument every day and, and playing? What fuels you to keep going? Coffee. Ah. <laughs> Shitty answer. I'm, dude, no, I'm I, just kidding. <laughs> it's funny because it's like I say that jokingly, but it's actually kind of serious because I've because hold on one second. kid's got the flu he's home from school he's like hey where's my rubik's cube <laughs> um i know kids are into those again yeah um i mean yeah i do i drink so much coffee it's not even safe i don't think like but you know it's like i mean honestly part of it is just being a parent you know yeah. like you gotta you got a big life now and you gotta I don't want to say maintain it but you've got to you've got responsibilities you know i've got two kids i've got a wife i've got a house i've got all this grown-up stuff you know and that's the funny part like i don't really feel like a grown-up even though on paper i am that's a good thing but to be though it's killer yeah. but it's funny you'll pick your kid and you're like oh that guy's way more grown <laughs> <laughs> That guy's probably an accountant. Or... But, uh, I think that he inspires me or fuels me in a sense. It's just, I mean, it's part of gratitude, it's service. It's got. Oh. And it's like really the big thing that. It was a big proponent of my way of looking at life. You know, it was kind of a, you the people I was around, like, kind of, you know, programmed me that way. You know, or, or the, the things I've done, like, you know, certain things you do that you're not supposed to talk about, like, you know, like you know, anonymous things, mm-hmm. you know, that, that help you. Uh, but that help you like, you know, I don't know, man. It's like being of service to my kids, being of service to my wife, being of service to people that I come in contact with, you know, cause that's what makes me feel good. That's what gets me right with the world is like, you know, talking to some alcoholic that just is in his third week and has no idea how he's going to make it through week four and giving some kid like that hope, you know, like, I mean, honestly, that's what fucking fuels me. Like being able to change, not change lives or save people, but you know, like I coach my son's baseball team Mm -hmm. and it's fucking gnarly. It's like next level. It's getting to the next level, like two games a week and practice and, there's a full on draft and there's this and there's that and there's managers meetings and all this shit. And it's like, when I see a kid that, you know, can't hit the ball to save his life in the beginning of the season. And then, you know, three games in, he gets a hit that fucking feeling of joy, you know, is un unmeasurable. Like there is no better feeling than seeing the light come on in someone's eyes or, seeing that kid get a hit that never got a hit or, you know, that's why they make movies about that shit. Yeah. But that's what fuels me to live my, you know, to get up in the morning. Cause it's like, I mean, it sounds corny, but, and I never think about it, but I know when I talk about it, it's like, that is, I know every day I have that opportunity. You know, if my, if I do all the things I need to do to get my head right, you know, 
and and musically it's like i've just been so fortunate to to fucking make a living doing this shit and, and to come up with new projects and do things and and to to just do it all like the way you know it's not like oh i could do it all exactly the way i want to but it's kind of worked out that way you know like i wanted to start this all-star cover band to do events and stuff like that and play with all my favorite people and you know it's like i was able to do that and yeah. play you know like a huge nine inch nails fan and i a huge Robin Fink fan. So I had a gig where I was like, you know, asked Joey for Robin's number and talked to him and got to meet him and play with him and just fucking watch him from the other side of the stage and be like, that guy's so rad. I'm fucking playing with that guy right now. This is happening. Crazy. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that kind of shit. It's like, or I met with some friend of mine yesterday that does all this stuff for NFL channel. It was like talking about doing some shit you know potentially with that it's just like i don't know man it's pretty pretty fucking it's pretty great that's freaking rad that sounds really cool and it must take a lot of coffee to keep you going i'm curious how, how much coffee do you actually consume in a day dude you know when you have the drip coffee maker uh -huh. so i do six it's on like six cups i guess yeah so I get up at six in the morning. I I meditate for fifteen minutes before everyone gets up. Then I wake up the kids. But before I always have to have the coffee set up the night before. Mm. So it's like I set it up, six cups, wake up, drink that as fast as I can, meditate. So then by the time I'm done meditating, the coffee's kicking in. <laughs> and then wake up the kids. Get them, you know, do the lunches, go to school, take them to school. Then I get back, I go work out, and I, I'd say about noon, another cup of coffee. Then around three thirty, another cup of coffee, and then <laughs> if sometimes in the evening, more coffee. <laughs> Sounds like that's, us. That's yeah. That's, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's I knew I was normal. talking to the right guys. Yeah. We haven't died yet, yeah. so yeah, it's all good. You're good. It's all good, <laughs> dude. It's so funny. I always find these like, <laughs> I always find these like, fucking articles. You know, like you get all these feeds on your phone, and it's like every once in a while, because I'll find an article that says, you know, like the benefits of coffee cures cancer and does all this <laughs> shit, and I show it to my wife because she's like, you drink too much coffee. Like, yeah, but look, but look. <laughs> I'll never get foot cancer because <laughs> it says that they, they, they will stop it. And <laughs> it's good for lycopene yeah. for your eyes or whatever. It's like <laughs> yeah. all these fucking retarded things. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're happy to keep you caffeinated. And um, I can't thank you enough for taking time to talk with us today. Uh, finally, for our listeners and our watchers out there, where is the easiest way that they could find you? Do you do social media um, or do you have any upcoming projects that you want to plug? Um, I mean, I have a, like I said, all-star cover band with uh, called the Hellcat Saints. You can just look that up if you Google it and you can see, you know, we've done a bunch of stuff with Chester Bennington and Joey and, you know, a bunch of different people. Um, that uh i'm what what do i do <laughs> dave kushner dave kushner on instagram uh dave kushner 66 on twitter but you know when i got go, goes in waves yeah you know just like it's um it's hard and the, you know I, <laughs> my wife was like the other day she's like don't you have a website i was like yeah i think i do <laughs> and then we looked and then it's like you know the fucking domains like it's just like three dudes you know like pictures of like the what's it, what do they call that like the geek squad yeah you know it looked like three dudes from the geek squad just like hey want to buy this domain <laughs> like, oh fucking great there it goes <laughs> so yeah basically it's just instagram and twitter when i'm when i'm doing it and uh we got the next 
we're actually composing the music for season three of F is for Family. Awesome. Which I think comes out later this year. Oh, very new, cool. Ten, ten new episodes. Um, yeah, and that's kind of it for right now. That's a lot. That's awesome. Um, again, man, you know, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. It really was. Thank you so much for talk, for taking the time. Yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, I really, I dig the company. I love the coffee. It's like, you know, it's like you get the heavy, you know, you're, I was drawn in by like the art, you know, and then it was like, oh, wait, fair trade? Wait, organic? And wait, oh, wait, this tastes really good, you know? And it's just funny, like, why you get drawn in yeah. and, you know, for the subversive nature of it all. And then it's like, wow, this is fucking probably some of the best coffee I've I've had and, and drink on a daily basis. Awesome. So, you know, and everyone there has been super cool and, and Blasco and those guys being tied into it and, and Zach and, you know, it's, it's, it's really cool, man. Awesome. So I, 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 you know, any time I have, any time I can support you guys as well by doing whatever you do, it's like, it's just, you know, it's all good. Well, I, uh, I'll i say this right now. You are officially part of our family, for sure. Yes. <laughs> yeah, man, we're super grateful to be a part of this company, and like it's it's really cool to to be in such a happening spot. But I, I have to say that the coolest part of this gig is getting to talk to you know my idols, my heroes, awesome, talented people like you. And it's I, we're just so grateful that you know guys like you and yourself take the time to to sit here and bring us through the their journey of life which is just so awesome man yeah well i mean it's not you don't make it you don't make it hard when it's like oh you're gonna get free coffee <laughs> you're gonna get a mug and you just get to talk about yourself for an hour yeah oh, okay cool <laughs> <laughs> cool man well thank you so much uh i hope one day we get to meet i like i said just such a big fan and thank you so much man we'll be in touch yeah sure. no thank you guys all right, cool. Talk to you soon, brother. This has been Fueled by Deathcast, a Death Wish Coffee Company podcast production. Thanks for listening.